I'd like to welcome to One to One, John Taylor Duran Duran. Hello, John. Hi. Oh, you must have got an awful lot of extraordinary awards on your mantelpiece at home, including things like World's Most Beautiful Man, and all those sort of smash hit type of things. I mean, mm. what was that like to live with? Um, it was a lot of fun. Yeah? Yeah. Um, it was hard not to uh, take it too seriously. Um, you know, you got, I, I, I suppose I got quite taken up in it for a while. Mm. Um, but, um, you know, I look at Smash It's Now and I see Jason Donovan's winning and, you know, you have to hand these things over. Well, exactly. I mean, is it easy to hand the mantle over? Yeah, I think so. I'm quite happy about where I'm at. So, you know, I'm not longing for, for something that was there once. When Duran Duran started, what, what were your dreams then? To be screamed at at airports. Really. <laughs> it really was? Yeah, I think it was, actually. And to have ten articulated trucks with that full of gear. Um, it, was, it, it wasn't really... Uh, that was... Uh, I can always remember singing Beatles songs. And, uh, yeah, I wanted to be a pop star. It was a whole new career uh, uh, that was formed in the 60s. It didn't really... It, it's not like, a, you know, a doctor or something uh, that, that, that existed through centuries of study. This was a whole new whole new job, like Formula One racing or something, you know. Yeah, I want to be one of those. I like that. Did it all happen very easily, do you think? Yeah, yeah. You're um, not supposed to, John. Well, um, no, it's not supposed to, but um, it was a, it, it was chemistry, you know, and it, it, it was just right. And uh, I suppose we were I mean, I, I'd, I'd followed music for it was it was everything to me, and uh, I, it was a, it was a route. We kind of followed a route that seemed I don't know. The people in the band were aware of, and the people that were managing us were aware of, and um, and yeah, we just we happened to have something that record companies wanted, mm. or, and then and it turned out lots of people wanted too. Uh, let's talk about the fans because. Um Durani's had the most wonderful profile. Now, this is something you couldn't have created. No. Um, yeah, well, it, I, again, I suppose the... We were coming out of uh, punk's dark ages, and um, pop music was being looked at in a bla very black and white sense. What, and what, what year are we on now? I suppose we're like 1978, 79. And um, really, with the 80s, I mean, the nearest thing you had to pure pop was Blondie, really. And um, I think even The Clash probably made it onto the cover of Smash Hits at one point. But, you know, Smash Hits was still being outsold by The Enemy and Melody Maker and Sounds and blah, blah. And, uh, and I, I don't know, the suddenly people wanted to see pop, wanted to see colour again. And um, that whole, I don't think Smash Hits had never had, well, I mean, they didn't have, uh, awards when we used to win them, and they certainly didn't have award shows, thank God. Um, uh, I think that that whole thing kind of kind of grew, and suddenly it was kind of cool to be pop. Who decides that you are a success? Is it record sales? Is it publicity? What point did you think, hey, we've done it? Um, Brighton Dome for me. Was, was it when people were just not listening to what we were doing and they were just screaming at us uh, ceaselessly for about 50 minutes and that was just as the first album was being released and Girls on Film was just coming out as a single and that, that was a you know, point for me where I thought, yeah, okay, so this is success. <laughs> did you love it? Yeah, I think I did. <laughs> you took video very, well, not seriously, but it was very much a, a a part of the development of Duran Duran, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, I can remember walking into a meeting um, that our managers were having in, uh, at EMI, and there was uh, this guy, this director, Russell Mulcahy, and he just made the, the Vienna video for Ultravox, which um, <clears throat> I think was the first video that really killed the radio star. You know, it was, um, I mean, it put that I mean, yeah, Bohemian Rhapsody did too, but Queen were already a huge band at the time, and, and that Vienna thing really 
turned it around. And I, I think the record company, everybody was looking for a way of, of getting bands into different countries all at the same time, you know, rather than these terribly expensive promotion trips where they send the band down to Australia and then up to Austria and then around to Germany, all to promote the same single. And so, it, you know, the video solved that uh, problem. And, um, and with a band like ourselves, it was, it was an incredible way of exploiting the visual appeal. You've just touched on something, I was saying a video band, and it's just sort of reminded me that, as you say, when Duran started, MTV began, and that whole business about image, I mean, you were probably the first of that era of bands mm. who were incredibly, it was all, well, it appeared to be all about image. Yeah, well, it was something our management stayed quite in touch with because uh, I think the consortium that owned MTV were Warner Amex, right? Warner Brothers American Express, and they were developing this thing. And, and at, the at the time, um, our management credit to them, um, you know, thought this, this could be really, this could be something. And they stayed very closely. And at the time, they were like, uh, you know, there was no Who videos. There was no, American Radio was playing Paranoid back to back with Stairway to Heaven, back to back with Smoke on the Water. That was all that was being played. And there was no videos for that stuff. So, so MTV had to consider a whole new programming style. And so they were very grateful for whoever they were, anybody that would take it seriously enough to make attractive programming yes. for them. Presumably there was a lot of trouble about um, Girls on Film. It's very well, yeah, naughty. But that was, that was the, it was, yeah, but it was made with that, with that in mind, really. It, 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 I, I suppose at the same time as, um, as MTV was happening, it was also a, also a burgeoning video rock club scene in America. And there were these clubs cropping up all over the country that were having these huge 12 foot by 12 foot screens. And um, it kind of filled the gap because disco was not popular. In, in a, well, I mean, there was the disco scene and then there was the live rock scene. And, and this was a way of, of bringing almost live rock in, in, into, in, into, into discos. So, uh, so we kind of made that, uh, that particular film, the long form film, with the late night American rock club scene in mind. And it turned up on the Playboy channel, I think. But, um, I mean, uh, the Surprise. idea, I I initially, I think the idea was to do it in a very artistic Helmut Newton kind of style, and it really ended up a little more Sunday sport than that. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's fun to make. And Kevin Godley is in it, isn't he? <laughs> Let's talk about Rio, which was a smashing song. Where was that? That was filmed in Antigua. And uh, the, the reason why it was filmed in Antigua um, was because we all went on holiday there. And these kind of things were always happening, actually. I think, I think we went to Sri Lanka to film Hungry Like the Wolf and Save a Prayer because we were in London and we were about to start a tour in Australia and we were looking for somewhere in between. But Antigua, we'd gone, four out of the five of us had gone there on holiday after an American tour. And, um, and we had a phone call saying, listen, uh, if you can hold on, if you can stay there for a couple more days, Andy's going to fly out and we're, we're going to fly out a film crew and we're going to film a couple of videos. Mm, uh, well, this is a holiday. We don't want to get into that. We'll pay for the holiday. OK. <laughs> you <know? laughs> so, yeah. you know, it, it, things like that. I mean, we've all, the videos were, yeah, they were all exotic locations and everything. You actually got quite a lot of stick over all that, didn't you? I seem to remember yeah. something about the girl with the pink telephone. Yeah, I remember Heaven 17 actually releasing an album called The Luxury Gap. And um, in an interview, they were saying, well, yeah, the luxury gap is like Duran Duran videos, you know. It's selling, you know, that kind of uh, lifestyle to uh, people, you know, that can't afford to take the bus. And it was like, what? You know, it's really taking the whole thing too seriously. For me, I'd never considered it like that because it was just like, well, you know, do they go and see James Bond films? I mean, that was my explanation at the time, you know. It's, uh, it was something I didn't really feel it needed it, to be questioned. Well, it was so it's just, more fantasy. It was entertainment. You know? What was always so interesting about Duran Duran was that you were the bros of X years ago. You wanted real acceptance as, you know, as, <laughs> as blokes who could actually play, yeah? yeah? I think everybody does, really. I'm mm. sure bros feel exactly the same way, and I'm sure they're, 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 if they're not being faced with those problems now, they will be pretty soon. It's, um, you don't... You, you don't think about it. The most, the quickest way to fame is through the pop idiom, and, and that's what everybody wants to be. The Beatles, they set the, the tone, 
and um, and then suddenly you're faced with the fact that you've got to make the White Album sooner or later, you know, and that's where you, you know, because if the Beatles hadn't have done that, they would still be remembered as, you know, trite popists or whatever, you know, and uh, you have to, you know, make that transition. How long do you think you can last? As long as we choose to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, do you feel pressure on you that you've got to come up with, you know, hit, hit singles? No, I, I, I feel a pressure, an eternal pressure in that unless I make music, unless I make music that is, that is worthwhile, um, then it's a waste of everybody's, t everybody's time. Um, yeah, things are different. Things are kind of different for us. Uh, we have to be a little more careful about what we do and, you know, we, we don't have the kind of budgets that we used to have to play around with and we've got to be a lot, a lot more caring in what we do. Yeah. So have you, you got need to have... Have you a lot of money then, yourself? I bet you have. <laughs> yeah, of course. Of course, because it was made available to us. And yeah. if it's made available to us, you'll spend it. Yeah. So you have, I mean, so Duran Duran, it's not that you're not all multimillionaires. Oh, we're, we're, we're adequately wealthy. You're right. Yeah. If you never worked again, you'd go I'd, I'd, be, uh, <laughs> I'd be in trouble in about five years' time. Really? Of course. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So, well, that's actually quite good, isn't it? Because it means you've got to get on with it. And yeah. You can't yeah, succeed. Like anybody. I mean, mm. we're, we all have our levels of expenditure yeah. and uh, resources and blah, 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 blah. I, I mean, I'm in a position where I don't have any responsibilities for anybody other than myself. Um, I, I'm sure if I had a wife and, fa and children, I'd, I'd feel a greater responsibility. Um, I can be a little more fickle, but nonetheless, I, I like what I've got. I've been lucky to, to have been given a lot for what I've done, and um, yeah, I'd like to keep it if possible. Yes. Yeah. All the rest of them kind of got married some years ago. You're the only one that hasn't. Well, I, well, I was, but now there's five of us. It's the, uh, the, the, the unmarrieds are in the majority again. Oh, now, I so. see. So that's okay. <laughs> Does it that affect the music? Of course, yeah. yeah. I don't know in what way it'll affect it, but uh, it's kind of harder to get Simon to write songs about girls these days. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, other than Yasmin, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. Actually, talking I about mean, who'd want to write songs about anybody other than Yasmin? Yeah. That's what he yeah. says to me. What would you most like to write a song about? Well, I, I, I'm still into sexual perversity. I, I, I think that's what most pop song, uh, rock songs should yeah. be written about. I thought Skin Trade was excellent. It didn't do as well as I'd hoped. No, but it, I'm glad it did what it did because it, it finally gave the critics a record that they could say they liked, you know, because it, you know, um, it stepped out of the, the, the chart, you know, it, it, it wasn't a chart hit, so, um, and, you know, you know, critics and hits. So mm -hmm. it was kind of nice that finally we had a record that when it came to the year-end roundup of favourite songs, it was in a lot of people. How do you and Simon and Nick get on now? I mean, you've been together, well... Famously. De decade? Yeah. Well, me and Nick have been together for, you know, 20, nearly 20 years. What? Yeah, we were, we were 11, I think I was, when I met him. So, um... Yeah, I mean, they're, they're the only two people I can relate to on a constant, you know, on every level. And there must have been a lot of rivalry, and, I'm, and I, I will not believe if you say there wasn't. Oh, incredible. Um, in a, in a band of, uh, like, really, you know, stunning guys, weren't you all, wasn't there? Well, it was, po yeah, I mean, politics is really what's responsible for breaking up most groups. So how did you resolve it then? I went away and made music with other people and found out, actually, that, <laughs> that um, you know, they were bigger pains in the ass than, than the, the guys in Duran. You're presumably talking about Power Station, partly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. When we talked to Robert De Palma, one-to-one -one, and I asked him why he had not taken part in Live Aid. He said, next question. <laughs> oh, what's the answer? What's the answer? I, I, I don't know. I think he felt that, um, I mean, I was very, uh, me and Andy were, were like the bulldozers of the project, really. And um, we, we want, Robert is not really a mover. And that was why he was in the, the position that he was. Uh, he was making terrific records, but nobody was really noticing them, not on a grand scale. And um, he was perfectly happy just to, you know, kind of, you know, come into Blake's once every 12 months and stay there for a couple of weeks and, you know, have a nice time. And, and we really wanted to, you know, w w we were used to this mammoth machine. And, um, I mean, the album was, a, was an incredible thing to make the Power Station album. 
Um, it just it just made itself, you know, and it was it was an incredible incredible chemistry, and it created a sound that I, I really was quite proud of, of having made actually. And um, and then we did want to take the thing out, and 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 and, and Robert did too, I think. But um, you know, me and Andy wanted it done our way, and uh, I think Robert and his and his manager kind of felt it was uh, it was our own faults really. I'm glad it happened that way because I probably wouldn't have gone back to Duran. I mean, I don't know how much of a, of a statement it really was against... I wasn't really happy with the, the Seven and the Ragged Tiger album, but it was my own fault, really. I hadn't involved myself that much in the making of it, and so when it turned out into, it turned into something that I didn't, wasn't really that fond of, I was I only had myself to blame, but I did want to go off and make a record that was more guitar oriented Why has it been chosen as now to put out your, your greatest hit sound? Well, it was something the record company wanted to do last year and they wanted to do the year before that and um, we really had to try to explain to them that um, if the record it was it's obviously an incredibly significant record in our history and um, we felt that we needed to get away from the old idea of Duran Duran as being you know the five piece the uh, you know the three tailors and the group that was um, we really needed time to to re-establish, um, or, or at least make a, a lengthier establishment of, of, of where we were now. And, uh, you know, it meant that, you know, nine of the 12 songs, uh, four of the, of the 12 songs, or four of the 14 songs, were, have been recorded by us since Andy and Roger left. And they're songs that I feel good about, you know. The, the last album, there was two top 10 hits, and, and Skin Trade, I think, is one of the best songs so really we were just playing for time and um, and I'm glad that it worked out that way because now the title of the record makes sense what were the problems about making the or compiling this decade album um, well it wasn't really that difficult it was pretty obvious what was going to go on and um, we kind of ran a little poll amongst some of the fans we were aware of and asked for their favourites. Um, we had little um, run-ins with the company over, you know, we wanted Skin Trade on and they wanted New Moon on Monday or something, you know. But essentially we, we kind of got what we wanted and uh, it was... Um, it, it's something you want to distance yourself from, really. You don't want to be too involved in it because it's... It's, it's not a good thing to get bogged down in the past. Let's talk about the Wild Boys video, because it, that really was an extravaganza, wasn't it? It caused a lot of dissent in the band, and uh, it was responsible for a lot of problems. Really? Well, I, I mean, I, th I felt the whole thing was fairly immoral, actually. And um, it, it kind of... We, 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 we were also filming... Uh, we started with the Wild Boys, and I think we were also making Arena at the same time, which was like this live, live film with lots of effects in it and stuff, and the whole thing just became a money pit, you know. Do you know how much it cost? No. No? <sighs> no. No. If I did, it's been wiped from the memory mm -hmm. banks, you know. I mean, Simon nearly drowned, didn't he? Um, yeah, but he likes all that kind of stuff, you know. I mean, he loves it, you know. And I think it was... I, yeah, it, w it was at the point where things were getting a little excessive, <laughs> to put it mildly.